So this is webinar number six of MediaCorp Executive Insights. And the theme today is engaging social first parents, millennials, and youth in this new normal that we live in. I'm very excited today to have three very well-known industry experts joining us. And it's my pleasure to introduce them one by one. First, we have Roshni Matani, who's the group CEO and founder of the Asian Parent, Singapore and Southeast Asia's number one parenting platform. Hi, Roshni, how are you? Doing really good. I'm very pumped up with your music in the morning. I felt like I should be dancing. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, thanks, Rosh, to, for being here. Next up, we have Mikey Slonim, who's the president for Vice Digital APAC. Vice, as many of you would know, is one of the world's leading youth media brands. Hi, Mikey. How are you doing? I'm very good. I'm having a good hair day, I think, today. <laughs> so I'm pretty happy about that. I love your background. I'm sure there's a story to it we'll hear later. <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, we have Sapna Angural, who's the head of English audience at MediaCorp. She oversees all English programming across TV, radio, and digital at MediaCorp. Hi, Sapna. How are you? Hi, Neil. I'm great. Yes, the music has really got us into the mood, so can't wait to kick it off. Great, great. Well, let's get started then. So just a quick overview on the MediaCorp digital network. Uh, we are Singapore's number one digital network. A little bit of a plug here, but, you know, we between our owned and operated platforms with MediaCorp, where we specialize really in general news, entertainment, and lifestyle. We've also come together with best-in-class partner platforms. And of course, two of our partners today are represented here, the Asian Parent and Vice, and very excited to, to take this uh, journey into, into what the new normal means for very specific audience segments. So to get started, since this is a social first session, what better way to, to introduce this topic than from a popular YouTuber in Singapore? Many of you might have seen his videos on YouTube. His name is Jian Hao Tan. Uh, we have a very short clip where Jian Hao takes, has a very humorous take on what the new normal means for some of us. Let's watch the clip. Ah, ah, ah. Why are you using your phone, Hao Hao? Are you studying or not? You have to make sure you become a doctor, you know. Doctor? Why doctor? Hello. Doctor makes a lot of money. huh? Doctor can help people. You can take care of mommy and bring me to beautiful places like Italy, like Korea. <gasps> Mom, I got full marks for my exam. Oh, Hao Papa is so proud of you. I'm one step closer to becoming a doctor. Hello? Uh, did you say doctor? Yeah. Uh, you never consider others? Uh, maybe a job that you don't have to go out and meet all the sick people? Uh, maybe you stay at home and be a YouTuber? Uh, uh, close your book. Close everything. Uh -huh. Take out your phone. Let me show you how to do rent again. Got a pretty girl on a turntable. Bunch of pretty girls on the couch. See a couple of mothers on the dance floor. They just got a bottle on the <laughs> Mikey, uh, any comments on, on trying the renegade on TikTok since you're a YouTuber I hear on the side? Yeah, well, it wasn't my mom doing the convincing. It was more my family. We ended up starting a, a, a YouTube channel as a, as a pet project, Super DNA Productions, if, if everyone or anyone wants to check it out afterwards. Um, a random hodgepodge of, of DIY home videos. <laughs> Great. We will make sure we do that. So. You know, the video ha takes a humorous take to it, but what does a new normal really mean for us? Um, leading management consultancy, Boston Consulting Group, just announced a few weeks back a framework that can help some of you when you're thinking about your brands or your consumers, think about what the factors are that drive this new normal and how you can start putting some of these behaviors into, into a framework. And they really talk about five factors that uh, impact how, or that influence how behaviors are changing. The first is past behavior. And this is past behavior specific to crises that have happened, right? In this region, it would be SARS or other similar crises where um, consumption behavior was impacted. The second is quality of intent. How desirable is the product or service that your brand is offering, right? And how quickly would, would audiences go back to it even if they were unable to do it during a certain period? The third one is around habit formation. We are all humans and we have a psychological bent of mind towards certain types of uh, functions. And if your product or service falls into one of these habits and is a habit forming product, um, it's more likely that uh, you know, you, your product would be sticky in these times. 
The fourth one is social acceptability. And that's really around the influence that your community and your social ecosystem has on, on the, whether or not you decide to pursue a certain activity. And the last is situational sentiment, which is more a broader macro view. Um, is it a good economy? Um, do, you, do you worry about your job? Those types of factors. So let's take a quick poll and you should see a, a poll pop up on your screen um, very shortly. We would love to hear from you, which of these factors for you, do you think will most likely explain consumption changes for your brands? Is it past behavior? Is it desirability? Uh, and you can pick multiple answers here. We would love to hear what you think. We'll give about 10, 15 seconds for the voting. I see the votes coming in. Just a couple more seconds. Our oh, votes are still coming in, so I guess we'll give it a little bit more time. Okay, I think we can, yeah, I think we can end the polling. Shall we show the results, Shaifam? Okay, great. So it's, you know, uh, the leading factor is, of course, overall sentiment, which makes sense. Um, everyone is worried about the outlook. But you see, uh, I think some of you agree that desirability is a big factor, right? Followed by the habit formation and social acceptability. So it seems quite a good spread across the different factors. As we go through the session, we'll hear from the experts on what their views are and how they think that uh, the consumption behavior is being impacted and, and what you can do about it as you're thinking about building your brand. So thanks for participating. So let's deep, go straight into the core topics for today. And we'll be covering three uh, that are topics in three major sections. The first will be around the shifting consumer behavior of parents and moms. We'll zoom into this segment and really try to understand uh, from Roshni how uh, this, this ecosystem is evolving and, and what some are some of the trends she's seeing and what some of the takeaways would be for you as uh, you think about your brand and positioning it for this audience. Then we'll move into the hopes and fears for youth and millennials. Um, what are some of the changes that, that Vice is seeing in the, in the landscape in Singapore and across the region um, and how some of these changes would impact, again, have implications for you and, as you think about your brand and strategy. And then we'll zoom out a little bit and Sapna will talk about uh, our experience at Media Corp crafting social first content strategy um, across platforms, right? And, and across a, a broader demographic. So with that, let's get started. Over to you, Roshni. Thanks, Neil. And, you know, I'm really glad to be here with Mikey and Sapna as well, and very interested to hear about their insights too. Uh, and good morning to everyone who's dialed in super early this morning and, you know, uh, looking to learn from us as well as share your experiences with us. Um, so I'm Roshni. I'm the CEO and founder of the Asian Parent Group. We're the largest mom uh, platform across Southeast Asia. So we've got about 35 million users across Southeast Asia, um, that log on to our website or go into our app. So that's basically nine in 10 pregnancies in Southeast Asia uh, register with the Asian parents. So we have a whole wealth of knowledge around the whole pregnancy journey and the child raising journey up till about six years of age. And today I'm going to share with you all about the digital consumptions of Singaporean moms pre-COVID and post-COVID. So after we've been hit with coronavirus, has there actually been a change in consumption habits? And what is it that moms are looking for? for? So for those of you who are family-oriented brands, I think the next 10 minutes uh, is going to be quite insightful because it was definitely very insightful for me when I saw some of these results. Uh, Neil? Yeah. So we did a short survey a couple of months ago, uh, somewhere in the middle of COVID-19, with around close to 600 moms in Southeast Asia, and we wanted to study their digital consumption habits. So we have a good mix of moms from various different age groups, from your Gen Z age group, which is basically under 24 years old. And believe it or not, in Singapore, we do have moms who are under 24 years old. In fact, I was just looking at the you know, ICA statistics and we have quite a, 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 about 400 to 500 teenage 
moms in Singapore every year. So uh, this is not a South, just a Southeast Asia phenomena of young marriages and you know, uh, young moms, but across, even in Singapore, we do have quite a bit of uh, moms who are Gen Z. We also ha uh, have a good representation of millennial moms. So these are moms who are between the ages of you know, 25 to close to 40. So I'm really glad that I still fall into the millennial mom bracket. <laughs> and nice. then we have the Gen X moms. <laughs> Um, and as you can see, the millennial and Gen X moms have higher household incomes compared to the Gen Z moms. And that's really because they're a little bit more older, so they're more ahead in their career. So, um, so if we look at the next slide, you'll see one of the first interesting findings is that both internet and broadcast TV usage shoots up. So a lot of people would think that, you know, young moms, internet surely would sh shoot up, right? But it was really interesting for us to note that broadcast TV also really shot up among the mom demographics. So 76% of Singaporean moms report now that they spend more time online and 54% of Singaporean moms report that they're watching more broadcast TV. 12% uh, even increased their internet usage by an astonishing eight hours more per day. So this is already on top of what they were spending pre-COVID, which was four to five hours. So now they're doing four to five hours plus eight hours, and that's 12% of the demographic. So we're definitely all internet junkies. Uh, if you look at a typical day of Singaporean moms, it constitutes these following activities. So she checks her social media, she messages friends and families, she searches for information, she reads news articles that have popped out from her own search or when you know she's on social media and she's on Instagram, Facebook. So she thinks she sees things that are shared by her friends or pushed out. Um, so these activities really should be no surprise. It's quite no brainer, right? It's what every single one of us does. But for moms out there, there's another place that they have to check in multiple times a day. And that's parenting apps and websites, which is good for me because that's the sole reason we exist. So I was very, very comforted to see this, this, this statistic. 72% of Singaporean moms browse parenting apps and websites on a daily basis. The things that moms do less often with less priority is reading eBooks, watching live streaming, listening to audiobooks, podcasts, and playing games on PC and laptops. So if you're a brand that's targeting moms in Singapore, one key insight here is not to jump on the podcast bandwagon as that's not where your audience is hanging out right now. Uh, so the top five watched content are, if we can just go to the next slide. So in the last seven days, the top five watched content was online TV, funny videos, parenting related videos, broadcast TV and fitness videos. So compared to other markets, Singapore moms watch more online TV and fitness videos. As a comparison, in Malaysia and Indonesia, the viewership of broadcast TV is a little bit higher than online TV. And Malaysians and Indonesians watch more beauty and makeup videos than Singaporean moms. But Singaporean moms watch a lot more fitness videos versus Indonesian or Malaysian moms. It was interesting that also across all markets, our moms really like funny videos. So if you're a brand, don't be scared to experiment with humor with our moms. You shouldn't be typecasting moms that were all powder blue and baby pink and we just want sappy emotional type ads. Uh, feel free to experiment with humor. Uh, when we look at the next slide, which is uh, mom's content consumption. So in June, other than reading COVID-19 updates and election updates, which all of us have been addicted to for the last two or three weeks, uh, moms read a lot of parenting and kids related content. These are your one-on-one -on -one things like how to swaddle a baby, how to potty train a baby, etc. 58% of moms are looking for cooking recipes and they're looking for easy to make one pot dishes, uh, uh, you know, things that I can cook in under 10 minutes, 15 minutes. 50% of moms are reading baby product reviews and 35% of them are reading and asking health related questions like how do I treat eczema? What do I do if my baby has a diaper rash, etc. When it comes to parenting content, uh, discipline is also a perennial favorite among our moms. So we're going to do a really quick poll with you all to just understand if, if you think parents should allow other people to discipline their kids. So this is, this could be your helper, these could be your grandparents, your neighbors, uh, the teachers. So do you think parents should allow people to discipline their kids? And then I'll share with you what our audience shared as well. And don't worry, this is anonymous. So we're not tracking who you are. <clears throat> uh, 
And discipline could be, you know, spanking, shouting, rotan, you name it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we clearly have a lot of Singaporean parents who are part of this webinar right now uh, because the results... <laughs> Uh, really do show that um, it's very aligned with what we see on the Asian parent as well. So for here, uh, the results was 60% uh, within reason and 24% uh, sometimes. And if we look at our own audience, it really does parallel it. So 74% of our parents allow others to discipline their kids. 73% of Singaporean parents do spank their kids. And 63% of them use the cane or the rotan to discipline their kids. So I, 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 to me, this is like, oh my God, because my mom used to rotan me all the time 20, 25 years ago. And I, you know, it's really interesting that Singaporeans haven't really changed that much when it comes to discipline 25 years later. Singaporean moms are also very open to reading and discussing about bedroom matters. So if we go to the next slide, it's great to see that COVID-19 hasn't put a damper on our mood with 61% of Singaporean parents saying that COVID hasn't affected their sex life. But unfortunately for our moms who are currently expecting and pregnant, pregnancy has had a huge impact on their sex life. So 77% of our moms worry that pregnancy sex will affect their baby. And the statistics is not small because we have more than 15,000 people who have uh, participated in these polls. Now, the sad thing is that, and you know, I really want to dispel the myth here. If you're pregnant, please go ahead and get your freak on, okay? So unless your doctor has told you not to, it is completely safe to have pregnancy sex. And uh, when we dig into the age group of moms and the correlation to the types of content they're reading, Gen Z moms, so those under 24, are reading up less COVID-19 content and they're reading more parenting related content compared to millennial and Gen X moms. And this really makes sense because Gen Z moms are newer, younger, they're first time moms. So they're really seeking for more parenting information and tips. We also investigated the shift from offline to online shopping for two categories, which is the diaper wipe category and the formula milk category. And the shift from offline to online is really obvious. From pre-COVID to end of March to end of April, it's a clear downtrend, right? So at end of a pre-COVID, it was 47% of moms were still buying diapers and 71% of them were still buying formula milk from physical store. But by the end of April, that number had plummeted down to just 13% and 17%. So it's, you know, of course, now that circuit breaker is now in phase two, we're going to see some bounce back to offline stores, but the e-commerce habit has definitely been accelerated and formed for these categories. So if you are a brand that is reaching out to young parents, it is critical that you have an online physical store. Oh, sorry, you have an online store, not just a physical store. Another key insight is that we see 21% of uh, brand switching. So sorry, back to the last slide. 21% uh, of brands switching for diapers and wipes when moms switch from offline to online shopping. The percentage of swapping is much less for formula milk. And the main reason for switching brands is because they see attractive promotions from other brands or due to stock issues. And if we go to the next slide, in terms of trust level or influence level, moms trust medical professionals the most, followed by their physical social community, word of mouth from friends and families, fellow parents, and of course, the online community, online reviews and parenting websites. But do note that with regards to celebrities and big influencers, so we're talking about people who have at least a couple of hundred thousand followers, their influence on mom's purchase decision isn't strong. So moms don't like to, uh, don't necessarily buy or get influenced by big celebrities and big influencers. They actually prefer micro influencers. So over on our end, we actually have a platform called VIP Parents that helps bring 30,000 nano influencers. A nano influencer is an everyday mom, right? A normal mom who has a couple of hundred followers and she's part of the same community that moms are part of, they look up to, they trust. So it works like word of mouth, which has a huge influence on their mom's purchase decision. So if you go to the next slide, I'll share with you guys a campaign that we did for Dr. Scholz recently. And it was very, very successful. So we had, uh, 
we did this campaign with about 14 different nano influencer moms. And uh, it was really about their compression stockings. And the campaign helped to build content for the brand, but it also helped to create brand awareness and conversions as we had a coupon redemption code. So in this case, the coupon redemption was 32% versus the typical average of 0.2%. So if you're going to be doing uh, campaigns where you want to work with influencers, my suggestion is to go with the everyday nano influencers over the bigger uh, celebrities and KOLs. Uh, if you're looking for affordable uh, ways to reach a bigger audience. And if you look at my last slide, uh, as we're a very, very researched focused company. Uh, so for all of you all who are part of the media, uh, media Corp network and have joined this webinar, we're very happy to give you all, you know, a complimentary poll uh, on the Asian parent. So you can do it for, you know, any market or for Singapore. And we'll send out your questions with five different uh, MCQ answers to our audience. And we'll send you back what their response is so that you can have better data decision driven marketing uh, campaigns for your different brands. So just drop us an email with MediaCorp Insights as your subject header to insights at ticklemedia.com and I'll be very happy to poll the Singaporean moms about how they feel. And Thank that's you. it from my end. So if uh, over to you, Neil, and unless the audience as well later on has some questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roshni. Yes, definitely. Please do keep sending us your questions. I see that there are already a few coming in. Um, and also feel free to send us just whatever you think about what we covered on the chat. Um, thanks, Roshni. That was really insightful. And for me, this interesting convergence between the content community and commerce uh, landscape that's happening, right? And how as online commerce is becoming a mainstay, how content really needs to be uh, you know, very, very focused around commerce. And the community uh, plays a big role, right? Like, as you mentioned, reviews and recommendations are so important uh, for moms to take purchasing decisions. Thanks. And then we'll uh, come back on the Q&A. Let's move on to the next section, which is uh, led by Mikey. Uh, and Mikey is going to talk a little bit about um, what this new normal means for, for the younger folks. Mikey, over to you. Hello, thanks for that, um, Roshni. That's really fascinating. Thanks, thanks, Neil. Hi, everyone. Um, look, if you're one of the 64 million households who watched The Tiger King on Netflix um, globally back back in March or early April, you'll recognise this man, this guy um, sitting behind me. Look, the, the the Tiger King was a really key marker uh, for for me for a lot of people of those those early days of of, of COVID. Uh, so he's here as a symbol of, of one of the central themes of, of what we've really seen and will continue to see, which is, of course, you know, an explosion in content consumption across all, all sorts of platforms. Uh, if we go over the page, uh, Neil, uh, we, we, we did a large scale um, research project um, um, during, during COVID to really understand the impact that it's having on young people across the world. Um, here's a snapshot of some of the findings for APAC, uh, which, of course, included uh, uh, Singapore in the sample. Um, social media use, no surprises there, through the roof. Um, picking up hobbies um, was big. Photography projects, learning the guitar, starting a YouTube channel. Um, sleep, it's an interesting one. We know from previous uh, research that when it, when it, when it comes to, to young people's health and wellness, interestingly, sleep is the number one thing that they think about, you know, well above even diet and exercise. So they've really used this time, you know, to, to get some extra Zs in. Uh, again, gaming is the, the fourth one. No surprises there. Interesting on the next one, you know, how, how it's really given people the chance to, to spend. Sorry, back there. Sorry, I was, I was just in number five. Um, there, it, it, um, it's really given a, a people a chance to actually spend more time um, reconnecting with, with friends despite being physically distanced. Um, apps like House Party took off, trivia nights, virtual drinks, all those, those things. And yes, it's been impossible to find baking flour or baking soda in cold storage um, uh, um, over the last few months. And because everyone's baking, including millennials, including Gen Z. Uh, now we can go over the page. Thanks, thanks, Neil. Um, when we ask them to sort of look at the, the crystal ball, see what, you know, what's, what have you got, got in mind for, for where this is all going? You know, young people really are in two minds. So half of them across APAC are thinking it will have a positive uh, long-term effect and, and, and half are thinking it's going to be uh, negative and, and have, you know, deep uncertainty around the future. In terms of the, the biggest societal changes they foresee, uh, two and three, I uh, think it will really change the way our economy 
operates. Uh, so there's, and I think that's synced probably with the first poll um, answers for, for, for where people uh, think, think habits are gonna um, be influenced by. So that there's this sense of, you know, uncertainty across, across the region around, around job security or job prospects, probably if you're coming out of education. Um, they're also thinking um, it will change the way we engage with our community, the way we socialize. And of course that's important because young people are intensely social creatures. And we all know this, you know, the, the way we work is, is, is going to be changed. Um, over the page uh, now, um, the key takeaways we see for brands all conveniently start with the letter C. It's amazing how that kind of tends to happen uh, with these things. So the, the, the first is to, to really find ways to connect um, with, with young people. You know, again, like we saw before, we've all been social distancing, we've all been physically apart, but in many respects, the world has never been more personal, more human. You know, we're all in this together. Young people are relying on connections to others for support to figure out, you know, how to get through this. Um, so connections with, with brands are, are really critical right now. And as a brand, as brands, you, you, so you need to speak openly with your audience, um, collaborate with them, um, be transparent, be honest. Um, uh, authenticity, it's, it's, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. It's a word that that is deeply attached to us as a brand, but, but it's, it's going to be increasingly important to, for, for, for you moving forward. Uh, create is the second one. So look, as, as we said, young people are consuming more content today than ever. Um, they're looking for things to understand, navigate their way through what's going on, uh, but they're also looking for content to escape, um, escape things. So there's a lot of opportunities for, for, for brands to create meaningful content. Um, there's, there's space to create content in forms or, or just entertains and lets them have fun. Um, you know, my advice would be be social first, um, experiment and, and, and have a crack. Um, and the final one is to contribute. Um, the, I think the pandemic has, has, has really elevated young people's sense of responsibility um, to, to making the world a, a better place, however cheesy that sounds. Um, you know, brands have a, have a power to help young generations make, make that difference. Um, so lean into the causes, lean into the people that they care about, uh, help support them. Um, you know, brands having a genuine sense of purpose, um, you know, that's been increasing in importance and it's here to stay. Um, and there's no time like the present really to, to start demonstrating it. Um, we go over the page, I'll, I'll, I'll show some examples of things that we've been doing in this space around the three C's. So look, in, in Indonesia, we, we have a really young and rabid audience um, a huge engagement, particularly on our Instagram uh, account over there. And we could see, our team could see that AR filters, so Instagram AR filters, um, if everyone's familiar with those, we're, ha we're having a real moment. Um, and so we, we, we created this, this which vice headline are you? Really simple AR filter that randomized all of our headlines. Um, this was in Bahasa, so you can see there. Um, randomized them, you press pause and it came up and stuck. You took a picture of it or you took a video of it and posted it to your stories and it just took off. Um, it was a real sort of opportunity for, for fans to connect with us and sort of demonstrate um, their fandom, have a funny moment. And it was, it was this real moment of connection. You can see the numbers there, you know, over 400,000 people did this. Um, that was pure organic, just putting it out into, into the world. So, you know, I think the, the, the takeout from that is, you know, of, of course, you know, young people are spending time on social. So just think about interesting ways um, you can connect with them there and AR filters can be a really simple um, um, thing to create and, and experiment with and engage them. If we go over, over the page, you know, an, another thing we've been um, experimenting with a lot, and I'm sure you, you've seen a lot of them as well, is, is live streams. Uh, again, you know, on the key platforms on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, you know, we've excused the pun here, but we did Visolation. Uh, a, a series of, of pretty simple sort of music performances, you know, captured in, in apartments, in bedrooms, with DJs, with bands. Um, it really is a way to support artists during, during lockdown and give them a platform um, to express themselves and connect with their fans. Um, you know, we've also done a number of live Insta stories uh, with mental health experts, with influencers, where, where our audience has been able to ask questions and connect with them. So again, the, the, the learning here is young people are, are looking for moments of connection and shared experiences. It can be about music. It could be, you know, cooking along with, with, with chefs. So, so look for ways that you can really facilitate those kinds of experiences. And again, this, this doesn't need to be high production. This can be really simple and, and inexpensive ways uh, uh, to do this and have a go. 
Um, over the page now, you know, on, on a larger scale to sort of show you, okay, this upper up level, we, we did take those two things that we've been experimenting with, AR filters, with live streams, and we worked with um, Singapore Super Club, Zook, I'm sure many of you on this call have, have hit the dance floor there over the years, um, with, with, uh, with Singapore Tourism Board, with their agency Zenith, around a, a project we call Futurescapes. Um, this was in, in late May. And the thinking around this was to really create something to connect with young people, um, stuck in their homes uh, 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 around the world and create a sense of a share, shared experience. So we held a three-day virtual rave uh, with sessions across three time zones on Friday, on Saturday, on, on Sunday, featuring international DJs uh, like, like Diplo, as well as local performers uh, like Young Raja. Um, I'm going to switch um, to um, a different Zoom background to show you some of these interactive, cool uh, virtual backgrounds that we did sort of leveraging uh, the, the different cityscapes of, of, of Singapore. No guesses for, for what those are. We created a couple of those and, uh, and those sort of form the background um, of, of, of what was happening uh, behind the DJs during it. I'm gonna leave that up. I hope that's not too distracting. If we go, go over the page now, we mind showing a, a video, just a little 30 second uh, video. If you're not awake yet, you will be awake after this, it's a little hype wrap up. <laughs> So it's a bit early for that kind of music. Um, and look, it was, it was really fun um, and, and, and cool. And then we took our learnings from those AR filters and, and outside of the people who got to experience uh, those things, we wanted to give them a chance to experience things on social. So, so we, we created these, these Instagram filters that, that let you bring the party and, and Singapore to where you are. Um, if you go over there, here, here's, here's one of the filters that actually let you dance with Diplo who was one of the headliners in your apartment. So if you can play that. So, so, so that, that's a video of someone using it. You could also sleep with Diplo. Again, using all of our insights and learning people, young people, apparently they want to sleep more, so we let them sleep. Um, uh, and then over, over the page was a really sort of fun one as well. We, we let you add the, your face to the, to the mirror line and have laser beams shoot out of your eyes. <laughs> Uh, cool. So yeah, look, uh, that's obviously a big, large-scale camp campaign. Um, you know, the essence is, is the same, and the themes are the same. It's you know, finding ways, interesting ways to to bring people together, finding interesting ways to entertain them, and and to participate in something, and being being very very social and trying new 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 things. Um, and then finally, over over the page, a good example. Of, um, of, of, you know, of the con contribute C, the final C, you know, and I, I think it wouldn't be COVID, a COVID webinar without talking about toilet paper, right? So, you know, it's funny, we, in, in early March, I think it was in Australia, um, people started hoarding toilet paper. They were very early in Australia to this idea of hoarding. We wrote this article, you know, asking people why the hell they're doing it. And it went bananas. It went, it went gay, like millions is one of the biggest pieces we've had. Um, globally all year. And one of the brands that, that has really reaped the rewards um, of, of this and, and has, has done so in a very meaningful and, and, and contributing way is an Australian company um, that you see here called Who Gives a Crap. Uh, now, they, they started, actually, a guy I know uh, started this uh, back in 2012. Their, their, their platform is pretty simple. You know, they discovered that over 2 billion people across the world don't have access to toilets. And, and hundreds of thousands of people, particularly children, are dying 
um, due to the lack of, of, of sanitation. So they created this toilet paper brand that, as you can see in that, that, that ad up there, is good for your bum, but great for the world. It's obviously 100% recycled. Very, very cool um, packaging. Uh, Direct-to-consumer model is, is, is the core of them. So you obviously you order online and it gets, to, gets delivered. And, and the kicker is they donate 50% of their profits to help build toilets and, and improve sanitation um, for people ar around the world. They've got a very fun, entertaining, highly social approach. In fact, when they first launched, they launched through a, a crowdfunding campaign and Simon, uh, the founder actually sat on a toilet in their warehouse and refused to get off until they'd raised enough um, money for the pre-orders uh, to start production. And that was, was a really good sort of way to launch the brand in, in, into the world. And anyway, of course, I remember seeing that their, their um, their, their homepage got, you know, a couple of days probably after, you know, that, that hoarding article came out and it sold out of, of toilet paper because everyone just jumped on it. They got their supply chain um, back on and going. And, you know, they just announced a couple of days ago that they donated close to $6 million um, to help build toilets around the world. So you can see that's, a, you know, a wonderful, you know, success story in this idea of contributing back. And, you know, I, I think what's also interesting about this is it's a, obviously a very boring product category, toilet paper. Um, but they've injected this, you know, both this sense of purpose into it to get, let young people buy into it and feel good about, about it and, and, and a lot of fun in, in the process. So I think the learning here for brands is look, way, look, look for ways to, to really build that sense of purpose um, into not just communication, but, but into the product or product experience or service experience uh, itself. And then just final page, wrapping up, back to our three Cs. Again, our, our advice uh, would be to, to see how you can experiment with these. You know, again, young people are looking to connect with you, be authentic in how you, you approach them, uh, be social first, create social first content that, that informs or entertains them, find ways um, to contribute to the things that they, they care about. Um, thanks for your time. Back to you, Neil. Thank you, Mikey. So I have two takeaways. One is that there's higher purpose to toilet paper. And the second one is, yeah, that, you know, it's really interesting that technology can has come to the point now where it can really enable all the three C's you're talking about, right? Like even the, if you're a brand with limited budget, you can still leverage some of these filters and, and technology tools that are out there um, to create these experiences and, and make it inclusive. Thank you, Mikey. And well, I learned like, something as well that Mikey has the coolest backgrounds ever. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we don't compete. Yeah, we don't soon, compete yeah. with those. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You, uh, would you consider giving those out to us uh, yeah. for our use in our meetings? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I might have to ask our friends at Singapore Tourism <laughs> Board, but um, sure, I think it'll be wonderful. It's a good. It's, it's a new advertising tool, right? <laughs> okay. To the world. Well, thank you very much. So next up, we have. Sapna, who will take us into a little bit of a journey around how at Media Corp we're thinking about social first content and our experiences with it. Over to you, Sapna. Thank you so much, Neil. And thank you, Mikey and Roche, for those interesting concepts and ideas and, and stats. It's really, I learned a lot just by listening to you guys. Um, this one part of this entire conversation that we're going to have a little bit, but I want to go back to what Mikey said earlier. I think the word authenticity for us in the last four months, that's really resonated in everything that we have done. I mean, um, the competition from, you know, whether it's coming directly from a content space or it's coming for brands in terms of choice levels available for consumers. Um, is I think it's really, really important for you to stand for what you believe in and what you have to offer. So even when you choose the filters, you have to be authentic to your personality as well. So, you know, we've, we've tried those uh, filters for our radio team and uh, we made sure that, you know, you don't put up a Diplo filter if you are spinning rock music from 1980s or 70s for that matter, right? So authenticity really goes down to uh, the basis of it. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit from um, so. I'll share with you some of the stats that are not, I mean, it's not rocket, rocket science, right? I mean, in the last four months, we've seen the uptake of the video content across the world. Southeast Asia has seen an uptake of 60%, up to 60% increase in the video time spent. Um, so here at MediaCorp, it's no surprise that we would also partake in a journey like that. Um, whilst we've seen increase across all categories, and because today we're passionately talking about the younger audience, 
Alliance. It's also heartening, encouraging to, to know, and it echoes Roshi's, Roshni's um, stats earlier that mums are watching more of us. So we've also seen similar trends in our weekly free-to-air uh, reach across the younger audience, 25 to 34, you know, touching slightly older between uh, up to 39 and encouragingly even the 15 to 24. And we certainly hope it's a habit that we can, you know, build within our audience and continue to serve them as well. Um, so beyond free to air, even for our digital video, we've seen um, extreme numbers come to us and we're trying our very best not to be complacent about it because the targets just keep going up, right? But interestingly, the major disruption for uh, most of the players, um, including us, has been the uptake in the long form content. Um, you know, as content creators and maybe perhaps even for brands that's relevant, you often want to make sure that your engagement is you know, deep and you want to be able to talk about your, um, have this conversation on a longer form basis. So the increase in long form content for us is really something that we want to take and, and grow that habit with our viewers. Um, and across categories, whether it's live, uh, which has picked up 26% and on demand is just shot off the roof, uh, you know, with double down on, on content across all categories. Um, news, entertainment, you know, whether it's uh, our coverage of COVID or whether it's our um, content uptake from the region, we have seen it, um, you know, increase across all categories. And I think it's brands. I mean, if you want to know more about where specific areas you can participate in, we can certainly share deep dive information with you. So what does that actually mean? I mean, how do we achieve all that? I mean, Singapore audiences, um, the report by uh, Media Partners Asia actually said that our growth was for premium demand products increased drastically for um, Netflix, Amazon Prime. We were the, the largest gain area for Amazon Prime. So why are Singapore audiences still watching us? I mean, there's tons of content. I don't know about you, but my tags on what I want to watch on a weekly basis just keep increasing and increasing. Not to mention the YouTube, uh, you know, the whole world of its own uh, of short form content. So there is no lack of choices available for uh, Singapore audiences. So what is it that we do um, that makes it different? So for us, it's localization and being authentic in localizing content. Um, we cannot outmarket, we cannot outbeat the budgets of the huge streaming platforms out there um, that are that have already entered Singapore successfully, but and lots more to come. Um, but we can certainly outbeat in terms of localization. So for us, it just basically means that um, you know go to down to the core of what is that authentic product that we want to talk about on a daily basis. Um, let go of the uh, platform specific strategies that we've had for decades and really think about content first. Then think about what would the social audiences be engaging in. Um, and I'll talk about that later in a bit. So we've talked about local experiences similar to what uh, Mikey talked about, you know, the lack of live um, events and not being able to touch and feel your uh, fandom and your audiences. It really got us to think about the local experiences. So we did um, a lot of those um, in the last four months and we've gotten um, hold of certain, uh, you know, local experience content that we think that we will continue to build in the near future as well. So, you know, whether it's a session with um, Sonia and Joachim with um, Jasmine Soko or Benjamin King coming out from his bedroom and telling us about his sleeping patterns and all of those conversations, it just basically allowed us to use uh, traditional platforms, marry it with social conversations, build up uh, our audience across all digital platforms and carry that through. We've also had to look at a you know um, huge production series like Code of Law, which was in the final season, was fully packaged and ready to roll out. And when COVID hit us, how do we now deliver that same series with a lot more, uh, with a completely different engagement story? So we also followed a huge social conversation pattern for that. Earlier last year, we talked about um, our first ever multilingual series, which was One to Eight Circle. Um, and it relates to many, many brands that are uh, having conversations with the Singaporeans at large, where if your target audience also includes, um, you know, the heartlands or, you know, whether it's a youth segment or I think the important 
um, lessons that we've learned from coming up with the first ever multilingual series is its authenticity is down to the core of it. We used that as a, as a yardstick and it wasn't just about including dialogues in Tamil, or Malay or, or Mandarin, it was more about the characters called for it and it wasn't about us just dumping down the content in four languages and making it available for the audience. It was about having that conversation, be committed to delivering it authentically to each and every different uh, part of our um, audience as well. And then again, the family setting viewings that we have, we have long running um, drama series like Kin, which we're constantly talking to brands about getting involved in conversations on socials, on uh, you know, on our FTA content and all of that, that continues to stay with us. Um, the COVID period has certainly challenged a lot of media owners and production companies to think about alternate solutions, and especially when uh, brands want to be part of that conversation. But I can only say that my experience in the four months has told us that um, nothing is impossible. I think it's just about maybe uh, lowering down your expectations slightly, be open to making mistakes and then saying, okay, this is not working out. Let's go with another different approach and um, not just always have 10 ticks on your plan. I think just five for now will do and then just go with it. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, yeah. So for us, this is what it meant. You know, we, we knew the audience explicitly through data point, but we needed to know them implicitly as well by you know deep diving into having conversations on socials this is actually a, a, a picture from a writer's room in one of our series the most successful drama series that we just launched it basically meant we needed to come up with many many different options of why this particular character will not resonate in today's time even though everything was already planned out it meant we go back and uh, you know remind people who have ability to influence conversation and sometimes it also means you check your ego at the door. Uh, many times we have preconceived notions about how do we want a particular campaign, how do we want a particular story, how do you want it to live because you're so passionate about it, but during this period we needed to just check all of that back and then you know really listen to the audience and um, if it meant telling the real life stories and telling the person to say, yeah, I know this is very passionate for you, but you know, the audience is not going to be invested in it. So let's just keep that, kick that story out completely and think about a brand new plot. It meant saying no to offlines many, many times before actually agreeing to it. And um, we think that we can still build a lot more stronger stories by doing things like that. So I would highly encourage uh, for brands, if you are not very sure about a campaign narrative, you're not very sure about this is the way to go. Um, whenever in doubt, do surveys, do focus groups, talk to people, let out a campaign notion on social to have that conversation and pick it up and then, you know, pivot as you go along with it. Um, yeah. Sorry, next. So it, it basically for us meant that whenever the opportunity arise, we would engage in hyper local conversation. So though the drama series could be in, in English, but we needed to make sure that the same narrative is available in all four languages. So that was just one example. And if brands wanted to participate in it, it would, they would have to you know, sort of join the same sort of bandwagon and also communicate in a similar approach so that we have a joint authentic voice as well. Yeah, and then after that, you know, I think this is sometimes a bit scary. You need to be bold enough to engage in direct conversations. So I'll give you an example. At the right, at the bottom, you see uh, the series Tito Tao is uh, our pride and joy. We've seen huge numbers coming to us um, uh, from a drama series, which is based on a true series, uh, a true story. Um, I was a very old premise, but we will really worried that the younger audience won't like it. Um, surprise, surprise, it was actually taken up very well. But it wasn't just the delivering the content per se. We engaged in direct conversations. We talked about uh, sitting in the plot lines on socials and were open to people telling us what they didn't understand. They didn't understand why the series was just in English. So they needed to understand why would we do a Wayang story and not make it available in Mandarin. So we took that back and we had already finished production. We looked at it and we said, okay, what do we do now? Um, though very difficult, very different approach. And uh, we decided to adapt the series in Mandarin right in the middle of COVID during Tatupeka. Uh, remotely gathered the team around, 
you know, it just didn't mean that you just dub the series, but it also meant re-record the original songs, get people in studios, deliver that. And that really paid off because uh, we were not apologetic about realizing we were authentic about the conversations. We were able to get people, like-minded people to get a buy-in as well. Um, it was a lot of work, but I think it sort of pays off as well. Um, so this is the difficult category. Sometimes you get caught in it. So my advice would be uh, a little bit different from what Rosh said earlier. So I'm going to contradict here. I do feel that leveraging celebrities and influencers, yes, including micro-influencers and um, does help campaign. I think it helps to drive the social conversations. Um, and just to plug in here, here at MediaCorp, we have over 100 uh, celebrities that can help you along that journey. We have content creators that can help you along that journey as well. Um, and of course, um, you know, the fact that we can deliver that content across, uh, you know, an array of uh, platforms, whether it's free to air, digital, or any of that, or, or, or audio for that matter, I think it's something that you might want to consider. Um, so Far So Good is one example of that, where we used our radio personalities and brought that conversation onto socials, leveraged their fanfare, talked, they talked about their uh, experiences with different, um, you know, local celebrities who had, I mean, honestly been really impacted, right? I mean, if you talk about Benjamin King, Nathan Hartenu, all these people came on board with us to share um, their experiences, what they were going through and what it felt like not being engaging in direct concerts or engagements with the, with the audience. So I would highly recommend that you leverage that circle. I mean, you don't always have to pick one big celebrity. You can always, um, you know, look at um, and balancing your budgets based on what's available. Um, and sometimes it could be a very small influencer that gives you that same sort of um, expansion opportunity as well but definitely something to consider. Uh, so I'm just gonna tell you about this, I'll show you a video, but before that, so this particular uh, content piece um, came out of 100% social listening conversations. Um, in the middle of Circuit Breaker, what we realized was parents and kids and very young audience, like because we also do kids programming, were talking about home-based learning on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. And we were, how do we get part of this conversation? How do we get answers to the parents? I mean, I'm, I'm a mom myself and often really, you know, wanted to know what exactly the HBL lesson was like. Like, are they really learning or they're just gossiping or what is going on? Like, you know, is the teacher really conducting the lesson properly? So we, we listened to the social conversations and the team got together and used an um, hundred percent drama IP line moms for those of you uh, know this IP it's about a drama series um, you know group of moms who are very passionate about their kids um, and probably came them as well <laughs> back to Russia's as that so we used that IP and created something very different have a look at this thanks Neil the lion moms are back this time, they are crash landing on your HBL classes. I'm gonna have a heart attack. And together with special guests. What's up, everybody? <laughs> they'll uncover how this situation has impacted our lives. Anybody worried about going back to school? And what's a class? So we have another quick news. Without a pop quiz. Oh. Don't miss the special series, Lion Mums Crash Landing on Schools, is available now on demand for free at mewatch.sg slash lion mums. Thanks, Neil. So we even had like Fundy Emmett come in in one of the episodes and talk about how PE lessons are being conducted on HBL. That was quite interesting. The series is now available on MeWatch. So if you're interested, please go ahead and watch it. Um, next up, I'm just going to pivot a little bit on another very big trend that we've noticed, um, especially with the younger audience, um, is the uptake on digital audio. Um, it's really doubled down in terms of 20%, 25% increase on our own uh, managed, own and operated platform, uh, Me Listen. But it's also known fact that the streaming platforms in terms of audio has also seen a worldwide, worldwide increase. Um, 
increasingly we see that it's not just direct audio uh, streaming from our, our radio platforms, but also a huge uptake on podcasts. So, Raj, I'm going to just disagree with you one more time here. Uh, that um, I think in it's Singapore, not just disagree with me; it's disagreeing <laughs> with the survey results. <laughs> sure, and I have, I have a maybe we have a solution that we can work on together. I'm going to get on a call with you right after this. So, the podcast um, uptake for us has, um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of podcasts available in the market. Um, the increase in content available on Spotify, Apple, um, all of these platforms has also increased just as us. Um, but we do see that this trend is here to stay. Um, it's new, I mean, relatively new, but not really in that sense. It's just that there has been a lot of hesitations. We were one of those people who were a bit hesitant about how entertainment podcasts will look like. News podcasts are known to be uh, informative and, and it's an easy uptake, but um, this is a journey that we've started and I, um, I thought that I should share a little bit more about what this entails. Um, so we just recently were super proud about this particular uh, podcast series that we've launched just two weeks out is the Biz Hacks podcast. Um, it's really about talking with business leaders about the impact of COVID and what the post COVID economy looks like experts. Um, it's available. We, we launched it in both English and um, uh, Mandarin and, and Chinese because we wanted to make sure that um, there is huge amount of uh, materials available for the SME businesses as well. Um, this is something that will um, go on for a 12 series if I'm if I'm not wrong and it's been already been supported by quite a number of brands as you see at the bottom of the screen like uh, GovTech, Singtel and so on. Um, we are superbly encouraged by the take up on through our listeners as well as of this morning I just checked the stats quickly uh, there are already about 5,000 downloads of uh, the podcast itself so we do think that it's, it's been slow, but it will definitely increase. Um, and here at Medical, we're also increasing the visibility of such content. So you will see, you will hear it on our traditional radio, you will hear it on our digital streaming platforms. Um, and it's an area of growth that we have identified. So um, with that, I think we will now we will also expand our entertainment podcast lineup. So I'm very happy to tell you that there's a series of very exciting podcast series that are coming through. A couple of it that we have um, already started, like the ghost stories and all that, that really resonate with uh, our audience. Uh, but we're going to be starting to do um, a couple of other ones that might be int uh, interesting for some of the brands uh, mentioned here like Let's Rock, which is our review uh, coming from the Expert Goal 90.5 team um, on a review of the old uh, generation of rock songs and, you know, really talking about what that meant during that era, era, era and, and so on. The one that I really wanted to highlight to you right now is um, a special series that is going to be uh, done by Sophie Golliher. She's one of our jocks from Class 95. She's a mom of two and often struggles with it. So she was... She tells us this in every single weekly meeting. So we decided, okay, why don't we share this with the rest of the audience and really make it brand friendly as well. So this is something, it's a demo. It's not the final product yet. So I'll leave you uh, to listen to that. Thanks. Podcast. I'm Sophie, a radio DJ by day. You might have heard me on Class 85 from 2 to 5 p.m. Hi. But by night, or basically any other time of the day, actually, I'm a mom to my toddlers and BFFs, Bowie Rose and Coco. Honestly, sometimes I don't know who's parenting who, but it's been a hoot. This is Bibs Babble and Baby. Yeah, so that was just a teaser, uh, and we'll make the full audio available for you. So yeah, I mean, uh, lastly, I just want to share uh, my take on the key takeaways for brands. I would say give a strong uh, emphasis on localizing your brand campaigns, leverage the local content. It uh, doesn't necessarily always have to be video call, but we are the experts at it. So um, it would be great for us to be part of that journey. Um, engage in social conversations, engage in conversation with your audience, uh, whether that means a direct conversation through focus groups or, you know, 
um, uh, digital surveys like what uh, Rosh has shared earlier, but um, more importantly, social conversations to continue that interaction, that engagement, which is so we are so deprived of at the moment, I think is hugely important for any brand strategy. And um, uh, device knee strategy on the fast growing medium basically means that, you know, like for us, we look at podcasts as a new trend, um, slow but steady. It would be something that we would love to be, uh, to help you as part of it as well. The thing that is not mentioned here and um, that I believe basically underpins all of that is really deep data as well. So if you have access to any sort of data that helps you to craft these strategies better, always, um, good to have that um, as the underpin underpinning of strategy line as well. So for us is we use data and because uh, we come from the creative house in terms of content creation, we marry the art and science of it to deliver campaigns that are made for Singapore, by Singapore and for all, all sorts of demos, not just the young ones. Yeah, thank you. Over to thank you, you, Neil. Thank you very much, Sapna. So with that, we've kind of come to the end of the presentation and this is just a summary slide with a couple of key takeaways. Um, since we're running a little tight on time, uh, maybe, I, and I know that some of our panelists have been addressing questions already. Uh, let me just take a couple of questions, um, Jade, if we have time for that, uh, which would be probably relevant for everyone. Um, the first one question is, do you think we'll see some of these digital strategies transcend this pandemic or will we go back to business as usual? example online raves so i guess this is for you mikey oh <laughs> uh, look look I, I i think we're not going back to normal for a while yet i mean obviously every market's very very, very different but, but but like there's a while to go yet is the first the first answer to that and I, I i think yeah look i think the answer is probably a mix of both like i i think we're finding new ways to do things that we would have tended to do something completely different. And I think those things will probably stick. And, you know, if you take the fashion industry as an interesting example right now, that obviously, you know, the, the traditional way of launching a range was obviously very physical and, you know, very exclusive shows. And it's been completely thrown out the door. But when you listen to, to people like Louis Vuitton's um, Virgil Abloh, you know, talk about this thing, it's actually, almost like exciting for them and, and they've, they've managed to sort of innovate their ways through it. And that, that, that's amazing what, what the fashion houses are doing at, at the moment. And Virgil sort of said, we're going seasonless. Uh, I, I think it remains to be seen how long that, 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 that goes for. But I, I do think it's forcing us to change the way we do things. And in doing so, I think we're going to reevaluate the way we have been doing things <laughs> and, and change forever. Yeah, that's great. Any, anything to add to Rosh and Sapna on that topic on whether some of these things are here to stay or not? Yeah, just to add, I mean, I, I do completely agree with Mikey that, you know, things have just completely gone uh, to totally uh, turntable right now, right? Um, and one of the things that we're seeing as well is a lot of brands are doing brand launches on Zoom. So, so that's something quite interesting, you know, where they're having uh, these, instead of having these offline launches, they're inviting 10, 15, 20 different people into a Zoom party and everyone's wearing the same color branded clothes on theme and, and uh, they're using that later on in press collaterals and materials. So I think everyone's really thinking about how can they uh, engage the audience online. And one of the feedback that we got from most of the parents is that they're so happy that they don't have to attend physical things anymore uh, because now you can go in and out of whatever you find interesting and you don't have to spend that whole one and a half hours traveling to a place and coming home. And more importantly, for a lot of women, we don't have to wear makeup. <laughs> yeah, agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll echo that as well. I think um, there are some trends that are here to stay. We look at our using our social reach as creating events like the Zoom parties that um, Rosh was mentioning. Um, some of the schools, like for example, doing the graduation parties online, it's so surreal, but it's it was real. And I think some of it will continue until um, this is fully over. We do think that we need to plan for the next wave where which of the trends you pick up and make it a little bit more stickier with the audience and what becomes a regular habit. But yeah, I, I think I agree with both of them. Okay, and then I guess we have time for one more question and would be great to hear all your uh, inputs on that. It's a very topical question. With what's happening in the world right now, what is the best way brands can communicate diversity without seeming patronizing and making it seem performative? That's a good question. Okay. Um, 
and uh, the right question, I think, to be a a a asking. I think like, my take on that, before you even start thinking about how you're communicating something, look inside and see what you're actually doing and how you're going as a brand, as a company, as a business, um, in terms of your staffing, your supplier chain, the way that you operate and work, before you even start to think about what you might start taking to communication. So yeah, I think you're, you're, you're right. I think the last thing you want to be seen doing is, is, is virtue signaling. And particularly with young audiences, they will call you on it Im Im immediately. Yeah, absolutely agree. I think you need to look at yourself first and then realize whether there are, are you making statements for the sake of being part of the conversation or is it really authentic to what you do on a day-to-day basis? Look, I mean, I think there is also an increased awareness in terms of people raising questions on what you do. Um, the conversations are a lot more than what they were four months ago, so it can be a little bit overwhelming as well. I mean, do you really start participating on something because, it's, you know, it's, it's trending? Uh, uh, or do you want to take a back seat and realize what your next course of action would be if that requires you to quickly change the mindset of people who have been around for a long time and it's always been done like that, that would be something that you would have to relook at it. But I feel like diversity in terms of, in a context like uh, Singapore, we've we've known it very close to our heart and which I, I, I maintain that authenticity is at the core of what you do. Um, whether it's a brand campaign that represents the communities uh, effectively or whether it's a campaign that is you know, one message for everyone. You just need to understand what that promise is. And it is from tough to tail all the way through. Um, so just to add to that, I completely agree that first of all, we shouldn't be jumping on the bandwagon. So only do, uh, you know, causes that you really believe in uh, inherently as an organization, inherently as, um, you know, the founders, the CEOs or the brand managers. Um, and, if you don't believe in it, then it's going to come across as unauthentic. And then the second thing is that if you do choose to, you know, uh, promote one of these causes, um, and I think it's really important to get people who are part of that uh, cause to be involved and to vet through what you do before you publish it. Because if you are not directly part of that uh, group of uh, demographic of audience that you're trying to protect or help, then you don't really understand what they're going through. And so you could come across as patronizing, but if you get them involved and you have them QC it and say, hey, is this offensive or is this exactly how you feel? Then you know that uh, you can be sure it's gonna resonate with everyone else. And I, you know, I'm just gonna uh, you know, mention, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, Darius at 99.co launched the All Races Welcome campaign for, uh, you know, because of the racial prejudice in the property sector. And I think that really resonated with a lot of people because Darius was speaking from his own personal experience. And I think that's really, really critical that only talk about causes that you have been part of or you really feel passionate about because that's when people will know it's authentic. I think that's a great point just to add there, um, Roshni. And, and, you know, I, and I think this is more about doing things than just talking about them as well. I think sometimes as Mark, you know, we can default to what's the comms around this, but like, we've, again, you know, if I said, if I'm gonna have a three stage thing, look inside, figure out what you're gonna do, and then start thinking about how you're gonna communicate that. Cause you just don't wanna just communicate things cause it, there's nothing underneath it. Great, thank you so much everyone for the input. Um, so I guess we've kind of, we're out of time. Um, we'll just do a quick last poll on whether you found this webinar useful. Um, Chai Fung, do you wanna just put up the poll? Yeah, there we go. So just let us know whether you felt this webinar was helpful in helping you understand how to engage with um, social first parents, millennials and youth in this new normal that we live in. We should Can't abstain. We agree. Oh, oh, <laughs> hands up. Hands up, Roshni. <laughs> Both hands up. <laughs> Everyone, we're not now, now we just need your um, the Vice rave party music, Mikey. <laughs> okay. I think we can show the results. Okay, great. Wow. 
Well done, guys. Um, 29% strongly agree, 63% agree. So um, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today on MediaCorp Executive Insights. Thank you, Rosh, Mikey, and Sapna for spending time with us. And we will make sure uh, to come back to everyone with the questions that we were not able to answer today. And we'll make sure that we follow up on that. Um, and just make, uh, please do um, log into our next Executive Insights. One second, let me just make sure I have that slide up. We have an upcoming data and analytics webinar, uh, which will be announced in August. And, and the topic will be the value of premium and first party data. So please do join us for that. Thank you again. My name is Indra Neil from MediaCorp and thanks for joining us today. Have a good day.